Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. morning. Welcome to our worship Sunday. Worship Sunday is Lent. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Amen. And this week for me has been a little bit difficult just trying to navigate the madness that's going on. Uh, well, I mean, March madness with the basketball, but how do you uh, try to relate that to some of the madness that's going on in Washington these days, also in Ukraine? And, it's almost kind of a schizophrenic thing as far as the world and again emotionally how do you navigate all of that? And St. Augustine said that when it comes to the world, the, the, the city of man, there's always ultimately it's going to be about greed and power. That's, we see that a lot in our culture in this world. But he said as far as for the, for the city of God and for the kingdom of God and God's people, it's more it's the self-serving, it's self-giving to other people. And uh, as I think about the church, we are, you could say, like a ship, and we have this opportunity to be able to share with other people the, the life preserver, and that's the righteousness of Christ that saves and gives eternal life. And how can we do a better job of that? Um, sharing and passing out and granting this blessing of the life preserver to people's lives of righteousness. Gives life eternal. So I want to talk about that later. Also, please be reminded that in the back there's a, a bright blue box, and that's for Ukraine relief. So if you'd like to help with that, and there's matching funds uh, from the church uh, for whatever you give, it will be doubled. So please consider that also. And right now, uh, let's begin by singing the first step. <laughs>
rise as we for the invitation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, and to call upon it in prayer, in praise, in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, that we cannot free ourselves from our self sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church. Would you daily and richly forgive us all of our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be Thank you. 
Father. Your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all of our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience <coughs> through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us into himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you rise from the gospel as you're able? <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a, took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fat calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older brother was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. 
He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed a fat calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed, disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a, a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fat calf on him, for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he's found. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Would you be seated, please? <laughs> God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, good, great God, a significant word this day for your people. May you uh, cause them to be attentive. May your Holy Spirit speak to their hearts so that they, that we, can bring forth uh, what you desire, what you deserve, the fruits of our faith. In your mercy, bless this time of meditation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Amen. I think that most of you would agree that when it comes to Everything that's been going on in this country, it's really easy for us to lose track of some of the significant things that are taking place in the rest of the world. 
And one of those uh, events took place back in 1990. And that's when Nelson Mandela was released from prison after 27 years of hard labor. And then uh, two years later, he was elected president of South Africa. And there was much in the way of concern about civil war and bloodshed uh, because of the, uh, the South African police and that system of apartheid. Um, there was uh, brutality and atrocities that had taken place. And the first thing that Mandela did was when he was inaugurated, he asked his jailer to be on the podium with him. And then uh, he hired as his bodyguard one of the hated South African policemen. Uh, and he did that uh, because he tried to, whatever he could, to avert the desire of hatred into revenge. And then he uh, had one other big player when it came to this whole situation. And that's uh, this gentleman. Can we see the first slide? His name is Bishop Desmond Tutu. Maybe you've heard the name. Desmond Tutu. And Desmond Tutu started the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, in South Africa. And what they did is that uh, they would have people come in and share what had taken place, you know, the brutalities uh, that was, uh, uh, was commissioned, uh, the hearings were on radio or TV. And Mandela was not as concerned about justice, but instead he was uh, more concerned about reconciliation and healing. And so he made it very simple, that if a South African officer would come, would uh, confess that he, what he did, and just acknowledge his guilt that he could not be tried and punished, but he had to face his accusers. And so there was uh, much of this went out of his uh, very grueling time. And one of the uh, one of the occasions, uh, uh, an instance of uh, of this taking place had to do with an officer by the name of Van der Broek. And Van der Broek got on the witness stand and he shared that uh, he had gone to the home of a family. He had taken the 18-year-old son from that house, he with his friends, and they had shot him and then they burned him to death. And then eight years later, they went to that same house. They pulled out the husband, they found him, and they made his wife see as they doused him with gasoline and then burnt him to death. And so understandably, there was a much in the way of silence when the, an elderly woman who was the mother again, and also the wife of, of those two men came forward and they asked, what do you want? And she said that she requested that Van der Broek would take some of the fine place where uh, they had burnt her husband, and that they would, he would take some of the ashes, and that he would uh, bring them to her so there could be a proper burial. And uh, with head bowed, the officer said that he was, was going to do. But then she had one other request, and can we see this one? Mr. Van de Brock took all my family away from me. I still have a lot of love to give. Twice a month, I would like for him to come to the ghetto and spend a day with me so I can be a mother to him. And I would like Mr. Van de Brock to know that he has forgiven my God and that I forgive him too. I would like to embrace him so he can know that my forgiveness is real. And spontaneously in the courtroom, uh, there was a singing of amazing grace as this lady uh, began moving toward the witness stand. But Mr. Van der Brock did not hear any of it at all because he had fainted dead away. He was overwhelmed. And in truth, justice did not take place in South Africa through those hearings. But there was a reconciliation as those who would face such violence were willing to forgive. 
And wouldn't that have been such a much better thing in this country over the last couple of years when you think about all the looting, all the burning that's been taking place in our some of our major cities? Wouldn't something like that have been so much better? And when it comes to uh, that whole situation, I've just shared with you. There was a reconciliation, but it was uh, it was a reconciliation that was more horizontal. But what about the vertical? What about crimes against God? Where people consider the Ten Commandments to be optional. But we, we hear that uh, every sin is a crime against God. That's what King David said. David said that after he had uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband Uriah. He said, against you and you only, Lord, I will sin. So again, what about that? And then what about um, people who choose to live as if God does not even exist? Or those who mock God and encourage others to do? And there's a professor, David Farish, from the University of Washington, who uh, posted an op-ed in the New York Times. And in the Times, uh, he said that every year he has a talk with his young students, the talk he calls it. He's a professor, professor of evolutionary biology. And he shares with them that uh, science has made clear that belief in God is impossible what he said. But science doesn't say that because how do you bring something out of nothing? But again, that's kind of thinking. And then what about those who drag name God's name in the mud, the name of Jesus too? You wouldn't do that, people wouldn't do that with their own mother, but they do with their creator, the sustainer of their lives. You wouldn't do that with Muhammad, but they do with our God and with Jesus. And then what about people who just choose, again, to uh, follow their own idols, like money and success, and, um, entertainment, sensuality, what about them? Um, people, again, who just, as in that parable, like that son, choose to live in a bargain. What do you do about that? So when it comes to all of this, uh, I think the best summary is from Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their I mean, that's a really the way it is with mankind, just trying to break those chains, pull apart those chains, and God's uh, uh, demands on them, the commandments, and just shake their fist at God. And to me, the, the greatest uh, epitome of a, such a, a spirit is from the Invictus by William uh, Ernest Henley. Can we see that slide, please? It matters not how straight the gate. I'll charge the punishments of scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Again, what's God's deal? And when it comes to um, that first example I shared with you, reconciliation, when it comes on the horizontal level, yeah, there can be healing, but not justice. But our God demands justice. But how can this be? I mean, how can you just get your head around all of the trillions of crimes against God? How are we to understand this? And perhaps you've been in New York City, but they have the National Dead Clock there. And um, to me, it's one of the most impressive scenes is the National Dead Clock in New York City. And you can just Google it. But I mean, those just numbers fly 24 7. Trillions upon trillions, and it's the dead of 
our nation, but also the, the debt of each other. How do how, you understand? How can all of this be paid off, especially when you think about it, the fact? From Matthew chapter 18, we recognize that each one of us have a, have a debt. If God were to deed to God, it's like equal to $15 million. And then you think about Vandenbroek, we think of Hitler and Stan Wars, Helen, sins, past, present, future. How do you deal with all of that? What crimes against God? Who demands that? And when it comes to uh, trying to figure this out, Hinduism, their way is karma, the law of retribution. And so for an individual, uh, you've got to pay you know, if you do wrong. And for the average Hindu, you have to go through 6,800,000 reincarnations to finally get to the bottom. You've got to pay that much. And when it comes to Islam, you're weight on the scales. Your good deeds, you're bad. And if there's enough, not enough good deeds, there's judgment on that individual. But what does Christianity say about all of this? It's seemingly unfavorable. Christianity says what John the Baptist said. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But do you believe that? I mean, do you really in your heart of hearts? I mean, I just think about people who are looking from the outside in to the church. And they're saying, are you trying to tell me that some uneducated Jewish rabbi died 2,000 years? He paid for all of the sins of the world, past, present, and future. No wonder St. Paul called it the scandal of the cross. How are we to understand? What would be your response to that? To somebody asking you that question? What would the early Christians have said? And I believe in what they would have said. Because Jesus rose from the dead. And because he rose, we believe his word is true. That the, he did rise from the dead because the Jewish leaders did not take his body. They wanted to stay there. The Romans uh, cordoned it off with a seal. Grave Dalbert, did grave diggers do that? And then, no, because it was, it was sealed off with cars. Did the apostles do it? They were scared to death. They're hiding out. So Jesus rose from the dead. And that's why we believe this, because he rose, that his word is true. That the implausible has become possible. And that's what St. Paul's friend is here at today's lesson. Can we see the next slide? God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him the, we might be of the righteousness of God. Yeah, that's what today's lesson is today. And with that in mind, isn't it understandable of what Jesus went through on the cross? Everything that he had to deal with, all of that, that's the reason for the shame. Shame before his people, his family, Naked before his mother, shame upon shame upon shame, just rolling forth the shame. And considered again to uh, be an adulterer, though he's never lusted, never stole, but heaven considers him to be a thief. All of that was placed on him. Again, the reason why the nails, and again, because of the horror of suffocation, the beatings, the Whippings, mocking, all of that is because of this huge, immense debt that he paid on the cross. That's what we believe. That's what we're called to believe. But it's hard. 
The Jews do not believe that to this day. They say if, if God would not allow uh, Abraham to put to death his son Isaac, how could God allow his son to die? That's a Jewish thing. Islam says that uh, Jesus was much too good, so Allah took him away and put somebody else on top. That's the right People struggle. And maybe some of you remember Bill Donahue, the talk show host. And this is what Bill said. Let me see the next one. How could an all knowing and all loving God allow his son to be murdered on the cross in order to redeem my sin? If God the Father is so all loving, why did he come down and go to Calvary? That's what Bill said. But all these objectors are wrong. It's because in some mysterious way, God did come down. God was not just a bystander. But we hear that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That Jesus took all that punishment and absorbed it all. And he took that and, uh, with him to the tomb. And it was kept there. And he walked away, free of that. And it's a gift. And for anybody who will reach out in faith to receive it, that forgiveness is for them. For anybody who would receive that wonderful gift. And in our lesson, St. Paul says that we have been called to be ambassadors reconciliation. That's our job, to do this. To tell people what has taken place, I mean, that song, Hark the Herald of Christian, God and sinners reconciled. To be able to recognize that uh, the cry was not spoken, but it was also clear that when Jesus was dying, was saying, I love you! This love of God for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Marvelous truth. And it's a, such a wonderful truth that we're called to proclaim it as his ambassador. It's almost like, uh, remember when the Chicago Bulls won the three peaks? Uh, a lot of people talked about it. They shared it with other people. I mean, that was great news. And the reason why it was because it was a shared victory, it wasn't just their victory, the team's victory, but it was our victory. We felt that. And so that's what we're called to do. To share this truth that the impossible has been made possible. But of course there's one hitch with all of that, isn't there? I mean, when you really think about it. There's one hitch, and that's where I'm believing eight out of ten people, maybe nine out of ten people, honestly, if you were to ask them if they believe in an afterlife, and if they believe that they're going to get there, and you ask them why, you know what eight, nine out of ten people would say? I'm a good person. Yeah, I sin a little bit, but I'm basically a good person. How can we change? How can we get people to recognize this truth? That we are all, frankly, band of brothers. We've all truthfully had that $15 million debt, this immense debt. And I'm believing if people would really get that. And again, for many, most people these days said that basically our young people are more deists. If Jesus is somewhere way on the back burner. But if people would really get that, that immense debt that he pays for them, I'm believing that herd of wild horses would not keep them away from coming to the church. 
and gratitude for what God has done for them. Oh my God. So that's our task. And this is something that I'm continuing to work through in my mind because it's not happening very well when it comes to this world. People start thinking they're basically good. How can we get that, this message out? Because it, in truth, I mean, that's the parachute when the people are at the abyss. People are drowning and, and sin. I mean, it's, it's life preserver. And how can we do this? I'm believing it only happens as we ourselves recognize first what he's done for us. This immense debt that we have. And then as we recognize this, St. Paul says, the love of Christ constrains us. We gotta tell them. And especially as we start looking at people more with that sense and that attitude, this tremendous need that they have and this gift that we have to take. So I thought I'd leave that with you. This wonderful righteousness of Christ for us. But it's really our task that it's all to be about them that they also would receive. By God's strength. In Jesus. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts, keep your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Would you please rise now for the creed? I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, the very God of very God, begotten and unmade, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Would you be seated? We continue with the prayers of the church. We pray. Lord, you, your love is truly beyond belief. With Isaiah, we praise you, for though you have become angry with us, your wrath has turned away because of the redeeming blood of our Savior, and now you comfort us. Make your comfort and love come more alive in our hearts, that we would again, with gratitude for you paying that unpayable debt of sin, God were to be, that we would be so overwhelmed by your work at the cross that that love would compel us to share with others the gift of the life of jacket of Christ that saves from eternal wrath and grants everlasting love. Lord, help us in this day. Lord, in your mercy. 
by your spirit, awake our complacent hope to the reality of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And Holy Spirit, guide the leaders of the nation to rightly discern and combat the enslaving power of totalitarian dictatorship on the hearts and minds of millions of souls. Lord, have mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for our political leaders. We ask, Lord, that you would bless them, corporate employers, grant them wisdom and healing with what's taking place in our culture, in cyber attacks, economic subversion, among the nation. Prosper their ventures, lead them to provide meaningful employment for those desperately in need of jobs and support for their families. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we ask that you would be strong to save and bless the ministries of Samaritan's Purse, Mercy Ships, Mission India, Ukrainian Relief Union of Churches, so many, and other <coughs> organizations which go into harm's way to reach out to the poor and afflicted. By your spirit, open the way for mass conversion to Jesus, the Lord of light and life. Lord, in your mercy. The living and abiding Savior, prepare our hearts to receive rightly your presence through the body of blood in the Eucharist for the strengthening of our souls in this present ark. Lord, in your mercy. And also, Lord, we pray for Pastor Labu that you would prepare his heart, that he would be a man of God for this church, and that uh, you would prepare our hearts as uh, we await that time when he would come to this church in May. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, bless our Easter basket mission, our Sunday school that continues to struggle, may you further strengthen it. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us again to reach out and make this church to be a place that is receptive and well-received by people who are outsiders, that they might know that they don't have to be outsiders, but they are precious in your sight. Yes, Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you would grant us this grace regarding mission. Lord, in your mercy. And good shepherd, be the light of for those who trust, the companion of the lonely, the healer of those who are ill. And Lord, we remember Bernice Timmerman at home, Walter Krauss. We thank you that Pastor Davison is being further strengthening. We thank strengthen, we thank you that Marlene Johnson is with us. And further, Lord, God bless Fritz and Jeanette Moshman. Mary Phillips is going through major adjustments in the nursing home. And further bless, Lord, Regina Nish. Betty Heidi, Eric Baca, Liliana O'Donnell. We pray also for Jack Shannon and Bob Connor. And for Phil Jimkey, the brother of Joan Markworth, who's having difficult days. And for Alexandra Martinez, who's the head of the Heinrich House, which is very close to the church, is having difficult days. Lord, in your mercy. And further, Lord, bless uh, Heather Postolovich, Mary Lou Hess, Eileen Desiron, and Irene Schutz as they celebrate their birthdays, and many more. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, hear these our petitions, and we now pray as you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. We continue now with the service of the sacrament. 